Tonight, breaking news as we come on the air. Well, the power of social media's influence. Today, it seems like everyone is in a battle for the most clicks. It is well known that human attention is drawn to novelty. She has more than 5 million Instagram followers and over 15 million subscribers on YouTube channels. And a growing podcast can be an excellent travel companion. Companies paid out $744 million to Instagram influencers last year alone. What is contained in this information? Is the source credible? Where is this information gathered from. Anybody can deliver news via social media. But now with social media, it's much harder to tell the difference. So where can people go? So how can we tell the difference? Is there any way? When I was about seven years old, my parents decided to take their two oldest kids, that would be me, I was the oldest, and my next younger brother, Jeremy, who was about four at the time, They decided to take us to this brand new amusement park that had recently opened. And people all over were talking about it. I mean, everywhere. And when I say talking, I mean actually talking because this is in the day before there was posting, tweeting, threading, Xing, ticking, talking, and snapping. But if there was a pre-social media version of going viral, This place did it. And my parents were determined, like what appeared to be everybody on the planet, to go there. The amusement park, of course, was Walt Disney World. And even today, the entrance to Magic Kingdom, which is basically this picture, is virtually unchanged. I mean, the experience has been added to over the years. They now have Animal Kingdom, and they've got Hollywood Studios. They've got some additional water parks and some shopping experiences. But the iconic Magic Kingdom and Epcot uh, were both there on my inaugural trip as a young kid, and in many ways, they're pretty much unchanged. What else is unchanged is crowd volume. Even a half a century ago, Disney really knew how to attract a crowd. So after driving 800 miles over two days, crammed into our 70s version of a station wagon, family station wagon, with me, my mom, my dad, my younger brother, and mom's two young sisters, we finally arrived at what felt like a refugee crisis converging on Orlando. Tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people moving like this ant colony, trying to funnel through the the ticket counter, which was manned by a real person, by the way, because there were no kiosks. And then we got our hands stamped as the old-fashioned evidence of a legit entry. And then we shuffled shoulder to shoulder down Main Street like a herd of cattle. And it was in the middle of that mob that I heard the most horrifying words. After nearly half a century, just thinking about what happened still emotionally takes me back to that moment. And it, it was terrifying. I, I was standing there between my mom and my dad, people just everywhere all around us, and I heard my dad speak over my head to my mom with panic in his voice. He said, where's Jeremy? You could almost see the air in his lungs deflate. You could feel the terror overwhelm both of them, and and pretty quickly me too, because somewhere back there in that sea of people was my four-year-old brother. What happened next was a blur of adrenaline, but what I remember was what we did. And, And you know kind of what we did, right? I mean, in that exact situation, what would you do? When you'd run back there and look for him, of course, But while you're searching, you're also screaming. At the top of our lungs, we yelled his name. Our panic gave us this elevated volume, even in the midst of a million other voices all talking at the same time. Jeremy's ears could pluck out from all the noise the unique voice of his parents. In reality, my dad, his voice was not really louder than the unified mob but it was unique. More importantly, Jeremy knew the sound of dad's voice. And as he heard it, he ran towards it. And as he ran towards it, he yelled back at it, searching in the crowd for the only voice among thousands that really mattered to him. 50 years later, I I still remember the terror of that moment. And I remember the relief that we felt when we found him. And most importantly, I remember the lesson of it, that there are some voices that just matter more. 
And if you train your ear, you can hear those voices. Even above the reverberation of the voices in competition for your attention, you can learn to hear the one that is most valuable to you. In this series, we've been talking about being under the influence, a bit tongue-in-cheek, trying to sort through all kinds of voices, voices from your past, voices that are around you in this moment. And today, I want to finish this series by talking about the voice that I would argue matters than, uh, more than any other voice, the voice of God. For lots of people, this concept of the voice of God and being able to hear it is a great mystery. I, I have literally met with thousands of people in 25 years of ministry who would say some version of the voice of God is elusive and unhearable and unknowable. But listen to what Jesus said. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. This part of the Bible was written not in English, but in ancient Greek. And so they have to translate it into English. And, and sometimes we get underneath of it by going back to what was originally written, at least as close as we can get to it. And this word, listen, right here, when we look at the word choice that Jesus uses, the, it's an it's a active verb. And the tense that he chooses here means that the subject of this verb, that would be the sheep, are actively and intentionally and immediately paying attention. So you and I might say something like, listen up. But even then, even if I said that, it's, it's you, as a, as a, if you say this, it's you as a coach or a teacher or a parent imploring your kids or your team or your students to pay attention, right? But this verb requires no such enticement because it's assumed that the sheep are already paying attention. My sheep listen, they're already listening. They're actively listening for my voice. They're seeking the voice of the shepherd. And so when the shepherd calls to them, they can pick his voice out from all the rest of the noise. They already know his voice, they know it's him, and they follow. This is not some kind of special power endowed on a select few people who get the title priest or pastor. This is a skill that you can develop, and I can give you the tools. You just have to employ them. So listen up, because I'm going to give you the four components today of how to hear God's voice and how to know what he's saying to you. If you want to live under the influence of the one who has the power to guide your life well, this, what I'm going to give you today, will get you moving in the right direction. It's sort of a survey. It's a sample. It's not the comprehensive of all of it, but it'll get you moving there. What I'm about to show you is a principle that I learned a long time ago, and I have used ever since. I was doing a study called Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God, and Henry Blackaby, who died not long ago, he changed my life through this course, the course that he authored but he didn't invent the truth behind it. He just, he just showed me what God wanted me to know. And I'm hoping to help you in that way today too. So this is the phrase, the, the sentence that he wrote, pulling truths out of the Bible that I will show to you. He says, God speaks primarily through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. And what I'm going to ask you to do at all of our campuses right now is we're just going to read this out loud together. Here we go. God speaks primarily through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. But here's the thing. You need all four of these components. It's not like pick one. In fact, you're not picking at all. God's the one who's speaking. He's choosing the avenues through which he speaks. And you need, to be, uh, you need to be understanding, versed in all four of them. You need the Bible. You need prayer. You need to understand your circumstances from God's perspective. And you need the church confirming or not that you have heard correctly the voice of God. See, most people try to find God's voice using just one thing. 
like they'll just take their circumstances and they'll say, well, look, evaluating my circumstances, it must be that God is moving my life in this direction. That is super finicky and tricky because it's easy to manipulate your understanding of your situation to make it say whatever you want it to say. Same is true with the Bible. I'm just being honest here. You can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. You can pluck out one little verse here and there and just sort of make your own Bible. But that's not the point of the Bible. And prayer, me just saying, I heard God say this. Do you know how many crazy thoughts and ideas have come out of somebody saying, God told me so-and-so? You need multiple avenues, God speaking consistently the same thing. God will use all these tools and he'll line them up to speak to us, usually at least two, often three, sometimes all four, and he'll send a consistent message, never contradictory. This formula I have employed since I first learned it, and it has guided my life well ever since. I've been able to hear the voice of God and understand him along the way. And I don't mean like every single day for every single thing. I'm talking about guiding my life in a direction. So let's look at these four components. The first one is the Bible. The Bible is a critical tool for hearing God speak to you. In fact, I would suggest to you, you cannot get a clear picture of the voice of God, the direction God wants for your life, apart from the Bible. The Apostle Paul, one of the early church leaders, early followers of Jesus, he wrote these words. He said, all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what's right. God uses it, that is the Bible, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. All scripture is inspired by God. Another translation of the Bible says, all scripture is God-breathed. Because it is God-breathed, because it is God-inspired, the Bible is invaluable, particularly to people seeking the voice of God. It doesn't matter what your Bible looks like. I mean, some of us have old school Bibles. They're large print or leather bound. They look real nice. Some of us have an electronic version of a Bible, which I also use, by the way. Whatever version it is that you have, your Bible is a priceless ancient treasure. But it's not just something from back there. It transcends time. And you should feel honored to have one. More than that, you should feel honored to be able to read your Bible. More than that, reading your Bible will create, on a regular basis, if you do it regularly, it'll create a muscle memory that will help you hear the voice of God over all of the other voices that are fighting for your attention. The Bible is by far the most widely circulated book in all of human history. And even, the, even people who are not religious would say such a thing. It's kind of indisputed. There's no other book so revered on such a wide level. No other book's teachings are more widely accepted. Presidents and royalty bow to its author and strive to live and to lead their people under its influence. So the Bible's appeal really has no boundaries. Think about this, rich and poor, old and young, Westerners and Easterners, Republicans and Democrats. I mean, a majority of people on the planet today from all kinds of walks of life and spectrums and perspectives would agree that the Bible is in a class all by itself. What makes the Bible unique is that it is inspired by God himself. It is God breathed. Some of the stories in it aren't very flattering on human beings. So at times it's a little challenging, the truths that are revealed in it. But still God is trying to tell us how he interacted with human beings, how he intended creation to be, and sometimes how we have gone astray. The writer of Hebrews put it like this, the word of God is living and active. This is why it's not just an ancient document. God is still working through the pages of the Bible today. It's living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God uses the pages of the Bible to speak to you and to me and to help us become familiar with his voice. If you want to hear God, if you want to know what God is saying, you simply cannot do it apart from the Bible. I read the Bible every day. I don't tell you that so that you can think I'm pious or have some kind of special spirituality. I do it as a part of my daily routine to help me hear the voice of God. And it's not always a long stretch of time. I'm always in a Bible reading plan. Sometimes that Bible reading plan has me in the Bible for small periods of time every day, like 10 minutes. 
and other seasons I'm there for over half an hour. But a steady diet of reading the Bible is part of how God's voice becomes recognizable for me and for you. So if you've never done this before and you don't know where to begin, I would suggest you just start in the book of Matthew, this Matthew chapter one, verse one, and read a chapter every day. I promise you, if you do that, there are 28 chapters in the book of Matthew, so you'll finish in a month, and you won't, it won't take you 10 minutes every day of just reading. Now, I always like to have a notepad of some kind when I'm reading the Bible. I don't always journal. I've, I've had a struggle with journaling. Sometimes I've done it, and, and I've never been one of those people that's just, that's just become fun and natural, but I always am jotting some notes down. So I'll write a question like, why did this happen? Or sometimes I don't want to, I don't want to get sidetracked, so sometimes I'll read a name or a person or an event or a place that I don't know what it is, and I'll just say, I don't know what this is, what, what, and I'll go back and research it maybe later. Uh, sometimes I'll ask a question about why God is acting this way or something I don't understand. And oftentimes I'm jotting down something I hear God say to me. Just, just some words. Listen for the voice of God speaking to you as you read the pages of the Bible. Oh, and I almost forgot. Get rid of the distractions when you do this. Turn off your phone and everything else. Even if you're reading it electronically, you can, you can download to your phone an entire copy of the Bible so that you can read the Bible without being connected to the world. And can I just tell you something? This is gonna blow your mind. This is absolutely gonna blow some of your minds. You're not gonna believe it, but here it is. The world is still going to spin if you turn off your phone for 10 minutes. You can write that down in your notes. Life will go on without you being connected to the world all the time. Immerse yourself and hear God's voice and that's the point of reading the Bible, by the way. I want to make this clear. I don't read the Bible so that I can influence God. I read the Bible so God can influence me. That, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. The Bible's not a legal book where I'm trying to outmaneuver God for justifying so that I can justify what I want to do. I'm listening for God for what God wants me to do. And I'm tuning my ears to his voice so that I can follow God wherever he takes me. So you need the Bible. We could do a whole series. We have done a whole series. You need the Bible. The other thing that you need, the second thing you need is prayer. God speaks primarily through the Bible, prayer, circumstances in the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. You've got to have prayer. An old saint was one time asked, what's more important, reading the Bible or praying? And his answer was, what's more important to the bird, the right wing or the left one? Prayer is a key part of knowing the voice of God. And if I were to poll our church right now at all of our locations and say, what do you think prayer is? Lots of people would say, well, prayer is talking to God. And you'd be right. Half, right? Because the other half of praying is listening to God. And that's also why I turn off my distractions when I pray. I mean, after all, I want you to think about this. This is a little convicting for me. It probably will be a little convicting for you, but I'm just gonna say it, here it is. If God is speaking to me, who could possibly be important enough for me to say to God, hang on just a second, while I check my phone and I don't even know who it is yet? Seriously, if we wanna hear from God, I've gotta focus on him for a few minutes, put myself deliberately in his presence. And so I, I often begin a prayer with something like, God, I just wanna know you. I just wanna hear your voice. I just wanna follow you completely. So if you wanna give me course direction or course correction, I'm listening. Just speak to me, God, I'm all in, I'm listening. So my prayer is designed to help me center my mind and my spirit on God, not just dump the truck of all the things that I want him to do for me. See the difference? I was in this conference. Uh, we went to this conference in Atlanta a few years ago with some folks from our team here at PCC. And we were in this arena in Atlanta. There were 8,000 people there. And there wasn't a seat vacant and we were listening to some of the best speakers anywhere, people I still respect a lot and love to listen to, people like Andy Stanley and John Acuff and just top-notch communicators. And some of us got to really chuckling because there was this lady in the seat behind me, so we're in stadium seating, you know, so she's a little elevated, she's right behind me. And she's interacting with the communicator on the platform, and we were way up in the air, so the platform's way down there. She's communicating with him as if they're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And she did it in the most unusual way. 
So I've spoken at churches and been a part of churches that were very interactive, um, and, uh, in, and that's always fun and whatever, but, but this, this person just took it over the top. So Andy Stanley would say something you know, profound, and this is what we would do. This is what I would do. I'd be like, mm. Or Susan would sit next to me and be like, hey, that was, that was really great. That was great. We should probably write that down. But this lady behind me, Andy Stanley would say something profound. She would go, shut up. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> and then she would go, stop it. Just stop it. And I, I mean, I couldn't, I mean, I'm, I just, I, I laughed so hard. I, I mean, I couldn't help myself. I thought to myself, look, when I'm talking, I don't need one more person telling me to shut up. I mean, really. Now, obviously, she didn't really mean that. What she was doing was leaning in. She's fully engaged. She's responding positively to the things that were affecting her and influencing her. She was all in. And so after I laughed for a while, I thought, and I really do think this was the voice of God speaking to me, I thought, do I lean in when God is talking to me the way that I lean in when I'm listening to one of my favorite communicators? Hey, what if, what if while I'm reading the pages of the Bible or while I'm praying, when I'm sitting with God, and, and, and what, if, what if God says to me, when I hear his voice, if he says, listen, I want you to go over there, I want you to do that right there. I want you to invest your life in this way. I want you to say this to that person right there. I want you to move in this direction. What if when I hear God speak to me like that, I go, shut up, shut up, stop it. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't know if I can say that to God, but, but you get the point. When I'm in a posture of prayer, I'm in a conversation with God. I should be leaning in, sitting on the edge of my chair, fully engaged, and only then is he speaking. Because God's God. He doesn't need me. He just wants me, and he's never gonna like traction me into a conversation. He's never gonna force himself on me. I have to put myself there. So I wanna sit deliberately, intently, under his influence, and expect that he's going to speak, and he often does. But you know when he doesn't? When we just got half an ear on it. We just like one foot in, one foot in over here doing all this other stuff. God wants and deserves our undivided attention. And if you'll give him yours, he'll speak to you too. So we need the Bible, we need prayer, then we need circumstances, and by this what I mean is an evaluation of your circumstances from God's perspective. So going all the way back to Adam and Eve in the very first sin, when, when they were exposed and they felt shame, Adam says to God, uh, you know, you might know this story, God, you know, they, they, have, they have this meltdown and uh, God kind of calls them out and Adam says to God, the woman you put here gave me some of the food, and I ate it. In other words, it's her fault or your fault, but it ain't my fault. And this is, what we've, this is what we've done. Human tendency is to interpret our circumstances to serve our agenda. In Adam's case, I'm hungry, and the food looks good, and then blame it on God. It's not my fault. It's your fault. You're the one that created her. You put her here with me. And since this day, since this event, We've been doing the exact same thing ever since. We've been evaluating our circumstances to serve our agenda, what we want, what I want, and then we blame it on God. But I'm gonna tell you something that's gonna, that really will upset somebody. Truth is not relative. It's truth is not what you tell yourself it is. It's not like, you know, have we heard this phrase? Can I just say, this is just the cra this is the dumbest thing. Your, you know, your truth and my truth? What? No. It's not one thing to one person and one thing to something else. Truth is stable. Truth is consistent. I can prove it. Truth is a person. Jesus said it like this. I am the way, I am the truth and the life. Truth is not a situation. It is a person, and because truth is a person, the living person of Jesus Christ, who's still alive today, trying to be the director of your life, you don't know the truth about your circumstance until you have heard the truth from him. 
Until you understand your circumstance from God's perspective, you don't understand your circumstance. See, whether you know it or not, God is always at work around you. Jesus said it like this. He said, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. Very truly I tell you, by the way, this phrase, very truly I tell you, it's basically Jesus saying, listen up. Listen up. The son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. God is always, always, always at work around you. And we often cry out to God, right? And we wonder why God isn't doing something. And when we feel that way, we can stand on this truth. God is working. When we see him at work and when we don't, when we feel him working and when we don't, and God is bigger than our problems. And while God doesn't create every circumstance, a whole pile of the mess in my life was of my own making, God can and will use every circumstance. So what we have to do is see our circumstances not from our agenda, but from God's perspective. And I often ask this, when I'm in the middle of, you know, sort of chaos or strife or I'm having, going through a bad situation, whoever created it, however I got there, I often, I would say almost always ask this question, how can God use, how might God use what has happened in my past or what is happening right now for a greater purpose in my life? Because God is big enough to do that. We have to change our perspective. We've got to shift our paradigm and stop just looking at it from, from me. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the one who's got a greater plan, a grander vision, and the power to pull it all off. And so we have to get God's perspective. We're stacking these things now. I've got the Bible, and God's going to speak through this, and I've got the prayer. God's going to talk to me through prayer and an evaluation of my circumstances from God's perspective, and I'm listening for the consistent voice of God in all of it. And then we add the final component, the church. God speaks through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. God does not speak so that you can promote your agenda. He speaks to advance his cause. And what is his cause? That every person would know the truth of Jesus Christ, resulting in full life here, eternal life there, for every single person. So let's assume for a second, this isn't true for everybody here today, but let's assume for a second that you have dedicated your life to following Jesus. You're willing to submit to his cause, live under the direction of God's will and his work and his plan. And you want to hear God speak. And so we've talked a little bit about the Bible and, and a little bit about prayer and, and some about evaluating your circumstances from God's perspective. And now you must have the church. The church is maybe not what you think it is. The church as God designed it is not really a place. It's not, certainly not a building. And it's not an hour on your calendar every week. It's not really a service. It's really not even a religious exercise. The church is the critical vehicle through which God speaks and moves and changes the world. As we sometimes say, the church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. One of the primary functions of the church is to act as a functioning body made up of individual but interdependent parts. Paul wrote it like this. He said, for just as each one of us has a body with many members... And these members don't all have the same function. Elsewhere, he talks about your eyes and your ears and all, all the things. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Followers of Jesus are a part of a body that, that is God's agent for accomplishing his purpose in the world. What is his purpose? Full life here, eternal life there, for every single person. And that's why... I respectfully disagree with the notion that you can be a fully devoted follower of Jesus apart from the church. You cannot. And I'm not talking about salvation, like your entrance into heaven. I'm talking about the fullest life possible. The church, as messy as it is, and it is messy, including ours, it's just the nature of being people. As I often say, you know, the church is, the church is people are messy. That's what I often say. People are messy. Not me, but you know, you. Anyway, as messy as we all are, this is the body through which God speaks to the world, and it's a critical part of how God speaks to me and to you, to us together. 
How does this work? Let me show you. When I'm standing at a crossroads in my life, there's a decision point I have to make about anything significant, anything of consequence. Maybe it's a job change or a move or a relationship problem that I'm having or some issue in my marriage or something with a kid or whatever, a thousand things. If I'm facing a decision point that is consequential, I get together with the people that are a part of my church who, has, who have an intimate knowledge of my life. So these are people we've done li- I've done life with. And I tell them, and not just friends, by the way, these are people I'm on the journey towards God with, like we've agreed to that together. So then I gather them and I say, I sense God is moving me in this direction. And we'll go through like, well, tell me where you saw that in the Bible. Tell me how you've sensed that in prayer. Let's talk about how God has lined up your circumstances. But then this last piece. So I say, okay, here's how I see God at work. And this is the direction I think God is pointing me in. And then I tell them that I really sense God moving me here. And then I ask them, would they pray and confirm or refute after they hear from God that, this, that I'm supposed to go over here? In other words, I ask these people to pray on my behalf that God would tell them about me. And then we come together and I ask them to share what they're sensing God say about me. We take some time for this. This is highly vulnerable. You are giving this small group of people a tremendous amount of authority in your life. And you still get to make the final decision, of course. But I am trusting them to help me confirm or not the voice of God. This is one of the ways that we we check ourselves to make sure that I just haven't gone off on a whim and I'm just trying to manipulate God so that I can do what I want. You gotta have a high level of trust for this group to be able to speak into your life like this, but it's worth it. And it's an essential element. This is the way that the apostle Paul put it. He said, God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and to tell it in love like Christ in everything, to speak truth in love. We take it, we take our lead from Christ who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. Part of God's plan for the church was for God to be able to speak through the church. And I don't just mean speak to you through me or through the preacher. I'm talking about God speaking to us through each other. This is a critical component that is frankly often missing because some of us are just unwilling to go there. But it might be part of why you're not hearing from God or not hearing from him accurately. So God takes these components. He lines up always two, often three, sometimes all four, and never contradicts. The Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church. You need these tools to hear God speak to you. If my brother Jeremy had not known the voice of his parent, I'm terrified to think what would have happened and how our lives might have been changed. It wasn't just that my dad yelled for him, it was that Jeremy knew which voice to follow because he recognized that voice, because he'd been around it all the time, constantly. He was actively listening for that voice. And you can do that too. These practices, which I've just given you a taste of today, if you incorporate them into the rhythm of your life as a part of your ongoing pursuit of God, it will allow you to hear his voice, not just when you're in crisis, but every day. You can hear God. You can know what God is saying, and you can follow his influence, his voice to a better place, the best kind of place for your life. So let me ask you if you'd pray with me right now. God, thank you for uh, speaking to each of us. We think about the reality that there are 7 billion people on the planet. You don't need us, but you, you want to have relationship with us. You want us to have the best lives possible, and you know how to make that happen. So forgive us when we've not really gone all in on listening to you, and help us start anew, afresh, today. We want to hear from you, God. We're listening move among us. We love you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. God is always at work around us. You can hear his voice and be influenced by it. You can hear him through the Bible, through prayer, circumstances, and the church. So dig in. Let us know how we can help. If you need a Bible, just let me know. I'll be happy to send you one free of charge. And of course, if you need to talk with someone, I'm here for you as well. You can reach me by email at mark.tapscott at pccwire.net. So thanks for being here for this series, and be sure to join us next week as we begin a brand new series. We'll see you then.